Aloha from Hawaii. This is Lilu actually running today to live delicious with Elena. A little <laughs> bit of a change. We just we're having some fun here because I decided to interview Elena, this wonderful host that you have here in Hawaii. And I thought, why wouldn't I interview her on her show for a change? <laughs> so thank you for being a living delicious with Elena. Oh, thank you for inviting me, Lilu. It's it's my pleasure to be here. <laughs> How funny is this? I love it. I'm so grateful that I'm here spending this moment with you. I feel awkward. <laughs> I know, it's very I'm different. I'm supposed to sit here and I'm supposed to interview you. But there is, you know, there is, you have thousands of people watching and there is, there is literally many, many people that have questions that you're going to open up today. We're going to ask you those, those questions. So it's exciting oh, great. to get to know you a little bit better. <laughs> Shall I just because you have, <laughs> not, you have such an exciting uh, story here. Really, really not ordinary. You really took, you really had a lot of hard moments and hard times in life to come yes. to the place that you're now. Yeah. It's not like it happened overnight. You don't have those plain, one of those plain selling stories. Yeah. You tell us about that, that when you were 15 years old. Tell us what happened there. Because you made a major decision and I already see your eyes very watery <laughs> and moved by this. <laughs> this is funny. Um, I actually like that um, this, first of all, the show is not planned this way. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm glad I said to you, I'm ready to crack open and thank you for um, there are a few things in my life I never talk about, or I talk very vaguely, and one is the war. Uh, I was 15 years old when the war started in Croatia, and uh, it's not beautiful, you know, it's not, it's not, we watch on movies and we think this is war. That's not war, that's Hollywood. Mm -hmm. War is, uh, I've seen something that I believe nobody should ever see. Not, not any 15 year old should ever see. And my life was very bitter, very bitter. I was bitter. I had nothing to live for. I have nothing to look forward. Um, my twin sister, I have a twin sister, another one of me. <laughs> yes! <laughs> not that crazy. <laughs> <laughs> she's a, uh, she's a, um, we are, fraternal mm -hmm. or whatever you call it we're not identical but still we were separated um, my brother was sent to the front line he was only 19 um, my grandmother's house was bombed while my grandma was in the kitchen mm. but the bomb never exploded it just destroyed the entire house with the speed and the heaviness of it so she still has the bomb and use it as a door you know to put something to keep your door open. Mm -hmm. She used the bomb for oh. that. And of course it cannot explode. It's, um, people always ask that when they see the bomb, like, oh my God, no, 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 it's, it's okay, it cannot explode. Uh, it's deactivated. Uh, my best friend died. All that at 15? Yeah, in uh, the war. So it, it, war doesn't happen like, you know, it all happened suddenly. Yeah. Okay, you know, you think, it was over there. It all started in my country. But the, the shape of Croatia is very weird. So the few parts of Croatia were more affected than the other parts. I was eastern part which was affected. But it was far away, over there, 50 kilometers away. Oh, far away, 30 kilometers away. Far away, 20 kilometers away. And then one day, the mm. far away came. Mm. But it's, something is in the human mind. We always think it will never happen to me. And I was convinced, you know, I wanted to, you know, I was in love with Vanilla Ice and MC Hammer and just thinking these kind of things about what did I knew about life. And then one day we had a knock at the door and a soldier plastic bag. You have 20 minutes to put your, what you need in the bag and leave the rest. You may never see the rest because you don't know if your house is going to explode next. You don't know what's going to happen. So in 15 years, I had to make a decision. What do I need? What's important? Mm -hmm. And I was just like, just lost in my room. I want to put everything. And then I want to put nothing. I don't really need this. I don't really need that. And, and then from, from there to the shelter. And you sit in that cold floor in the shelter. And the, the bombs, the sound. 
firework. Uh, it's not a firework. It's not. And it's not like in the movies. It's, it's, in the movies, it's so harmless. I always watch war movies and just thought, Mom, I didn't feel it until I felt the movie. The, the, the movie came. Mm -hmm. And it's re different. And I never see the war movies the same way. I see some things are BS, not just Hollywood. But additionally but to that, you also were, had some confrontation at school. So yes, you I had some major bullying too. Like if that was not enough. Yeah, it started actually with my father. My family was, my father was, why am I saying this? Oh man, because okay. we want to see it. <laughs> we want to hear it. We okay. want to get okay. to know you more. It was just a, just a, just, he didn't care. And he made sure we know that. You know, I was, I grew up in a very big, expensive house. Everything was wealthy, rich neighborhood, which in that time was not there. It was socialistic system, Yugoslavia, mm. everything was kind of equal. But our neighborhood was bigger houses, newer houses, fancier cars. But I was a hungry child. I open the fridge to eat something, the shoe flies to my head. I bought this to myself, not for you. Mm -hmm. So I cannot eat food. And I was favorite child of three. So just the whole the issue of not deserving, growing up with the wealth but not having anything, you know, in the winter our room was cold, but the room in which he had exhibition of birds, he, had, he was a lover of birds, that room was heated up. The birds were warm. How did that make you feel? Like fruitless furniture. Yeah. I didn't even feel like a, like a person. Yeah. And I was favorite child. If when we wanted something, brother and sister would ask me to ask because that's a bigger chance we get it. But, you know, I remember I want to eat a shoe to my head. And you were not even validated at school. And that's when I, I think that's what I think now. I brought the energy of I'm nothing, I'm worthless, bully me, um, I cannot stand up for me. Yeah. I brought that, and the, the victim came, and of course the villain show up, mm -hmm. and everybody in the school. You know, I was 15. Um, no, before when we were 13 or whatever, started growing your body. Boys were touching me, spitting on me, spitting my hair, calling me names, kicking me. And I always would pray, God, please let, don't let them touch me today. And of course, they do it again. So I actually made a video on YouTube. Um, you know the movement, it gets better? No. The, the movement that uh, started when there was this boy who committed suicide as a gay mm. uh, because of bullying. So the, the movement started, other gay people were started to stand up and say it gets better. Mm. So don't give up your life. So I made a video, it gets better, in which I'm saying I was not gay, but I was bullied just for being alive. Mm -hmm. And in that video I shared that I would beat my breast with fist so they don't grow. Because I wanted to prevent, I thought if I'm good, but I was skinny little thing. I, everybody looked like girls, looked like, a, you know, developing girls. I looked like a kid. But I still thought if I stop any growth, I will be safe. Mm -hmm. They will not touch me. So I would beat myself until I bleed. You know, the breast, but still, you know, the same thing. So I think this is when it all started. The whole, from my father, then that, and then war. And then it was really like, come on. But you were, so that's when really your connection to God and started changing. Something happened though. Yes. Because um, you, there was way too much suffering. When the, when the bullies were really, um, I didn't know, I was so ashamed to say anything to anyone. You know, mom, they're touching me. You know, they, she knew the spit in my hair, my sister would sometimes tell, but the touching part, yeah. I was so shy. So, you know, I would just wake up in the morning before the sunrise and pray on my knees. I would pray what I knew. You know, my grandma was Catholic, my mom was a school teacher. In a communistic time, you cannot go to church, because otherwise mm -hmm. she would get fired as a teacher. So I had a few praying books, to, you know, that my grandma bought me as a kid. So I would pray the whole book on my knees every morning before school. God, please don't let them touch me today. Every morning. If they don't touch me when I come back from school, I'll pray again. And of course they touch me, but then I come home and say, thank you, God. They only touch me a little. Maybe I should still pray it. Because I just didn't know. The only place I had was that 
I don't know if it's a relationship with God or trying to reach to God. I didn't feel him responding, him or her, but I needed someone to, to hear me. Yeah. And I just prayed and prayed and prayed, and I felt the smell of death in the air. And I was thinking, I'm crazy, because I feel something is off. Mm. And I would go to a doctor, and they said, oh, it's just your uh, adolescent crisis. Mm -hmm. But it was actually, I was feeling the war before it started. So that, that was, but it was nice because, you know, I connected to God. I feel so weird. Oh my God, this is good. This is <laughs> great. But then it, it's interesting how you search for also, you know, part of you was wanting the validation from the outside. Mm -hmm. And everything was not validating. It was actually, it was less and less. It was taking away to the point where you must have said, you know, I know you don't come from war to delicious, living a delicious life where you're now, mm. but there is something that must have happened where you really saw that, you know, you're the one that's going to create that delicious life, or you have to take your first step. Mm. It, was, it was so bitter. My mind was, even after war was over, my mind, I still had these pictures if my, in my mind, the stuff, the, the, the things that, I hope nobody ever sees. Mm -hmm. It's the pictures in my mind, the anger at them. You know, from, from them the enemy, from them the our government, from them to the world, why the world didn't come and save us from whoever. Mm -hmm. We are in, a, in a, at 1991 and no people are coming to help. It, it's, it's across Italy, hello, it's center of Europe. Nobody's helping, so all the bitterness anger about them, the shame about who I am. Mm -hmm. I had extreme guilt about not saving the world, the, the country, because I prayed every day and I thought if I would be a good girl, my prayers would be answered. Mm -hmm. But because they were not, and so many people died, I was not good enough. So that was a lot of, and it was just all, all tasteless life. So how do you heal yourself um, from there? I remember feeling, because my best friend died, and um, her boyfriend um, also, he was a soldier, so he died of a bomb. So she actually always t thought about how she would want to die from bomb. And uh, I remember thinking how he, what happened to him and then what happened to her. And I thought, like, it may as well happen to me. Mm -hmm. But I thought, but I never had a good life. Can I just have a little bit of a good life, please? I, like, I want to taste it. And then that taste, the delicious is the taste that I didn't know. And it was something, I just, can I have, like, like a kid that wants to have one piece of chocolate or one gummy bear that they never had? I just wanted one piece. And I said, please, please. And it somehow I had to have the piece. I have to go and taste it. Mm -hmm. And I realized that I had no delicious thoughts or even peaceful thoughts. My thoughts were always disturbed, always anxious, always afraid of people. I had chronic, this, like, yeah. I'm outgoing and crazy, people think, but I had this, just I want to be alone and secluded. So every summer I would not go out and play with kids, I would just go be by myself. So I wanted to go inside, and also seeing, imagine now, you go out and everything you see, it's gone. That's war. Your bomb house is gone, the big shopping center, the big everything, roads, gone, no, no more. So the, the, what there is in life can be gone in a second, but my heart is all I have. Mm -hmm. And that's how I wanted to work on my heart. Mm. And that's so how you I moved, so when desire. did you move to the US? Oh, just recently, in 2004. So you did some of that healing already back in Croatia before coming here? I was here? a nun. I decided to become a nun. You were a nun? Yeah. I ran away from a refugee center. And because something bad happened in a refugee center, that was the tipping point for me. Like, I cannot see the death anymore. The baby so died. So total seclusion. Yeah. Baby died in a refugee center, and it was really, I had enough. Oh. And I ran away from refugee center, and I was alone on the street, <laughs> and I just said, God, show me. And that's how I became a nun, and I had a vow of celibacy, simplicity, and poverty. Wow. 
for seven years. Seven years. Mm -hmm. my, my becoming a woman years. I didn't know how to do anything. You know, I didn't know how to put makeup, how to you know, dress, how to you know, dye my hair, I think. How to kiss. How I funny. didn't know anything. That's how it started. And during those seven years, what happened? Did you come to a place where yes. you saw something was I needed new? it so bad. I really needed it. If I had to live my life all over, I would do it. If I had this life that way, I would still do it. It was beautiful. I saw people being peaceful. I saw people loving each other. Mm. I saw kindness. When I first came, they told me, you never hear unless we yell. We don't yell here. You better start listening. Wow. And I look, what do you mean? But because I grew up being yelled at, you know, not by my mom, by my father constantly. That's, you know, I didn't hear. Mm. I didn't know how to listen. And then from there, you start listening with the heart. And that's even more subtle. So if you want to be on a spiritual path, you have to have open heart. And your heart is closed and your, everything was closed. Mm -hmm. My ears could be open if you yell. I needed the intensity and drama and a lot of to hear mm -hmm. and then it was getting more subtle and more subtle and more subtle mm -hmm. and lots of prayer lots of meditation lots of lots of um, reading and just sweetness and it felt so good <laughs> like a forced retreat huh? seven year retreat yeah. yeah it was very sweet I I'm very grateful for it mm. so when you came out of the retreat I came out because um, I learned that it's still an institution and I was really honestly, in my opinion, honestly hungry searching for the truth. And then it's still an institution in which there is hierarchy and egos and things like that. So I, um, I gracefully exited the best gracefully way I could. And I had no clue how much is $100 worth, mm -hmm. 100 Croatian dollars. I was missionary. I was living in Germany and other places and serving there. So I, I had a hundred Deutschmark. I had no idea if you can buy a house for it or a bubble gum. I had no idea about anything. And I was... How courageous. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what a beautiful, courageous thing to do. Yeah, it was funny. Talking of stepping in the unknown. It was, and you know, I cannot go back to my mom because she told me don't go anywhere, but w w like nobody approved of what I had. I just knew this is, I'm done with this. It's time for new, but I, I was 15 years yeah. old in my mind in the body of a 21 year old. <gasps> I had no connections or you know, I didn't know anything yeah. about being a woman or. <laughs> but you, you met shortly after that, you met my your soulmate yes somebody that you loved so deeply for so many years yeah how did that happen we are well he was a priest <laughs> Perfect. so we knew a each priest. other we knew each other too from but we didn't really talk because it was not allowed to talk men and women if you talk to a man you look down on the floor oh no my. smiling no flirting you never talk to a man with a closed door always door open or somebody else in the room if you have to do something service oriented so we never really spoken, but you know, it's a closed community. So people know who does what a little gossip goes on everywhere. So they knew I left and uh, he left and we met <laughs> and voila, voila. Yeah, very sweet. But you felt you lived that unconditional love from what I understood. I was so loved. We, we really, really genuinely, we still love each other. Sweet, very deep, very spiritual very um, bringing out the best of each other really we would i'm cooking and he would read from spiritual books while i'm cooking you know then we would read all the time we would laugh all the time we had so much good life it was really good and life started becoming really delicious it was very delicious it already started before mm -hmm. i needed this the story was so intense mm -hmm. then and start peeling off in the while i was in the process of praying and mm -hmm. everything and then with him it started the building of new. We traveled the world. Where did you go? We went to Japan, to India, to Singapore, Malaysia. We went all around Europe. We lived in a little mini bus. And we were just playing on the streets, like a street performing. And just like traveling around. And like Croatian coast, Italian coast. And we were just 
we were little hippies and we didn't know anything about life. And uh, he was a musician, he also had a band, he was a punk, punk musician. Oh. So that was, I'm meeting that scene, the dark scene and all these tattooed people and I'm thinking, where am I? <laughs> so it was all, but I felt safe because I was his. Yeah. It was fun, a really fun life. That was a good part. Yes. But very spiritual. And we would just go sometimes for, for like a day or two. We would just be silent and not talk, just inside. We would dream the same dreams, he and I. I wake up, you know what I dreamt? And he continues the dream. So it was really good, really good. And yet it stopped. Hmm? And yet it stopped. Our relationship, um, it didn't stop. The love didn't stop. The marriage stopped. But um, the connection is still there. I, I wanted to become you know, I was already 27 and I wanted to be a woman. I wanted to wear high heels. I wanted to wear nails. I wanted to have short skirts. I wanted to, you know, try the world. Mm -hmm. And he was, because of his illness, he was very sick, his body, all, some, lots of diseases on the skin. He was wanting to go more deeper into spirituality. Mm -hmm. Like really, not religious, but spirituality. And I wanted to taste the world. And if we were together in Asia, he would get really sick, really. Uh, if we were together in Europe, I would sleep with, oh, like mm -hmm. this. And he was feeling, I'm getting suffocated. And he had a dream that I'm trying to ride a white horse on the Trafalgar Square in London. And I'm trying to be the world woman, and the horse was dying under me like all salivating and being really like weak. And he was trying to help me. And then the, our spiritual guide came and said to him, look over there. And he said, no, no, let's help her. He said, no, 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 look over there. And he said, the moment I, he looked, I stood up, the horse was healthy, masculine. My hair was beautiful, long, blonde, which he knew I always dreamt of having a long blonde hair. And I was riding on a horse happy. I just waved to them. And this is when he knew. He told me the dream and he said, it's time for you to, to go and you will be healthy, you will be fine. So how, how does it make you feel to now be, you know, you're a coach, you're a speaker, you're living this delicious life in Hawaii, you're a TV host, I mean, wow. Yeah. <laughs> how do you feel? Um, I feel a little trapped because um, there is this wild, delicious me that is so, so, yeah, yes. When I show up, I'm convinced, Lilu. Now I'm convinced this is my truth. When I show up, the world is a better place. I'm convinced that when I show up, evil disappears. I, mm. it just, that's, I bring the sunshine. But because I'm a coach, because I'm an emotional freedom expert, and all the other people in my industry are pro proper and polite and they be therapists for 30 years and most of them have a, don't have bodies like I have and don't have personality like mine and, and I feel a lot of pressure to fit in with them. And I feel that if I'm just teaching people how to be happy, because I believe that's the purpose of life, what's the use of, of everything you have if you don't know how to be happy? Mm -hmm. So there's this conflict in me in which I know how to help people get over their emotional problems, but I know it's worth nothing mm -hmm. unless you want to be happy. If you, if you are not angry anymore, but you are not happy, you are just on zero. Let's go delicious. From down to delicious. Mm -hmm. It's possible. Mm -hmm. It doesn't go overnight, but let's taste. So I feel trapped. And I thought I'll never say this on TV. And, and they're <laughs> pulling it out of me now. I feel like I'm going to lose clients. Oh my God. This is great. This is great. I'm really excited to have this conversation because this is really true spiritual partnership that we have because it's helping another God. going beyond, you know, whatever they have. And this is what we all, I feel, you know, we're on the planet to do, to help each other. So where are you going to take this from there? I don't know. Good. <laughs> I'm really scared. I'm feeling really scared. I know there is this wildness in me that is so important. The time has come. It's not wildness like crazy, like I'm going to go get drunk. No. It's just a life. 
yeah. boiling inside of yes. me. Yes. And I'm trying to just be polite and be proper and be somebody else. And I know I cannot be somebody else anymore. Mm -hmm. I was somebody else for a very long time. Mm. And I am now, I always say, I live delicious 80% of the time. The other 20 is your fault. <laughs> Whoever is you. Yeah. <laughs> so because that's what we do in life. But I really believe I do live delicious. I, I can help people live delicious. Not just overcome fear, anxiety, shame, anger, guilt. Just deeper. Yes. But first I have to do it for me. Yes. On this new level. Yeah. And it's scary. <laughs> and it is true that you have this capacity just being around you. We feel, you know, there's this ease and and fun and bubbliness and that's a true gift I believe that you have that, that, that you give to other people you hang out with or that you coach and that's, that's something very very special there Did and you yet there's this whole other new level. Did you sometimes feel afraid of your own gifts that you had for people? Always yeah. That's how I feel about that gift it's like a gift blessing and a curse mm -hmm. at the same time. But by not shining the purest more beautiful light that you have you're not allowing others to do the same. It's true, but, yep, it's like, sometimes I wish, can I just be a plain Jane? <laughs> but I don't want to be a plain Jane. Yeah. I don't want to wear plain Jane clothes and talk plain Jane accent. I want to have my accent in yeah. my clothes. So knowing, you know, knowing that your soul is in this body and that we're here sitting here, what, you know, what do you think your soul came here to do? What would you say your soul, your vision, if, your mission? If I'm really, really peaceful and in a meditation, um, when I said before, when I show up, the world is a better place. Mm -hmm. But I have to show up mm -hmm. with my light, not with my story, not with my fear. I, I used to show up with a story. Now I show up with a um, hesitation. Mm -hmm. I show up with being appropriate. I show up with professional. But I just really want to, like, I made a video, jeans dipping. I just want to go and do crazy things. I just want to, like, it's not, I don't want to die with the music still in me. Mm -hmm. Well, so, it's yes. time to close this. It's time. <laughs> it is time, and that was a delicious, beautiful time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for watching. This was the Live Delicious with Elena, hosted by Lilu. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for so opening up. <laughs>